God is good and he loves us so immensely and so well and so good that he takes care of our lives. And even when things are a struggle, he's there with us. He's there loving us and walking alongside us. And we have a real good reason to have hope. We have an incredible reason to have hope. The 16th and 17th century, Christianity saw a really interesting, uh, I don't know how to put this in words and put it, there, there's not really much joy in it. There's not much hope in it. What happened in the 16th and 17th century is that Christians, Protestants, were trying so hard to not be Catholic that they missed the really good things that are there to be celebrated and to have joy in, and they were avoiding some of those things. And one of those big things that ended up being fought against, there was almost a war against this, um, and I would say that that war is still going on today, is this war against Christmas. Because the truth is, Jesus was born. And to avoid the fact that Jesus was born is to avoid the truth of this living hope, this good hope that was born, that came into the world, and that came into the world that we may have life and have it abundantly. But the war on Christmas was really interesting because things came into play that just, I thought they used to make sense, and I've been thinking about it lately, and some of those things just don't make sense. Here's one of them. Jesus wasn't born at the end of uh, December because the shepherds were out with the sheep, and it's cold out during winter, and they wouldn't be out with the sheep at night. And then last year, um, I, don't, I don't think, I think climate's always been changing. There was a night last year that was beautiful. It was warm. It was like 60 degrees all night at the end of December. Do you guys remember that? It was wonderful. Why can't shepherds be out at night around a fire? I know some of you guys who like to camp out when it's below 30 degrees around a fire and enjoy that. Shepherds can be out at night. That's not a good argument. And then there's some other arguments going around that are sometimes they'll show up as memes on social media about how um, this worship of Saturnalius or something like that, is, there's this Roman religion that... Um, the Christians adopted Christmas to be like? And even atheists will argue, that's a really dumb argument. Because they didn't even start that pagan religion until 200-something A.D., 200 years after Jesus was born. That's a really bad argument. Even atheists will argue that. And the people keep trying to bring up thing after thing and try to have a war against Christmas, and the real truth is our Savior was born. Hope came into this world, and there is good news. This war has gone so far that in the end of the 1800s, there was a philosopher in Germany named Friedrich Nietzsche who, instead of saying that Christmas isn't real, went so far to say that God is dead and tried to argue that he could live whatever kind of life he wanted to live now. And really, if you read a little bit about his life, he led a really dirty, disgusting life. He could live whatever kind of life he wanted to live now because there really is no reason for standards, norms, rules, or anything because there is no God. God is dead. And what's weird about that is in order to say God is dead, that means he thinks he must have once been leave, living, but he was trying to deny that. Nietzsche's whole philosophy is just completely illogical and crazy. And by the way, look at his life. You'll see that pretty much true, what his life ended up becoming. Poor guy, because he didn't ever get to know the hope that we get to know. This truth that Jesus was born, Jesus became flesh, Jesus became like us, he became Emmanuel, God with us. And you know, it's very possible he was born at the end of December. And I believe with all my heart, not only on Christmas, but the whole entire year, we should be celebrating and being full of joy with this truth that Jesus was born and he joined us. This is why Peter writes 1 Peter chapter 1. It's a beautiful, beautiful discussion about who we are as Christians, the hope that we have, the hope in birth and renewal and rightness that we have. So this morning for the message, what I would like to do is share this joy with you. I want you to get rid of the falsehood, the fight, the war against Christmas and all that stuff that came up in the 16th and 17th century and is still going on today and be full of hope and joy. Because as Paul said in Romans chapter 14, we're free to celebrate holidays and we're free not to because every day is a day given to us from God. So celebrate all day, every single day that Jesus is born if you want. And I encourage you, I encourage you to find a reason for hope because hope is born and hope is real. I want to read 1 Peter chapter 1 with you because there is some really, really good news, good stuff in this chapter. I'm going to start in verse number 3. Well, you know what? We'll start with verse 1, because it's always fun to start at the beginning of a letter, especially when it's so full of joy like this one is. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, 
according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience in Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling of his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. First of all, he begins that as he begins his whole entire letter with this, that may grace, mercy be given to you, be, be multiplied to you. And he begins by talking about that grace and mercy. Jesus was born, and that we get to be born again because of him, because of this living hope that we have. Now, I know that this is in almost every single sermon that I've ever heard in my life, but I've never really heard about it talk about this way. Well, maybe I have, and maybe I just hadn't paid attention very well. We worship a living God. We worship a God who is not dead. We worship a God who is so living, he became like us. And when he did die and give up his life, he rose again on that third day because he's living. Do you remember what he did after he hung out with the disciples? They, they were wondering if he's really risen and what they were doing. He ate with them. He met with them while they were eating because he's living. He is real. He is right now. And because of that, we have hope. We have joy. We have a reason to celebrate and go into this world and recognize that no matter what comes, God's living and he's there right there with us in it. In an, to an inheritance that is imperishable. By the way, imperishable means not able to die, not able to be destroyed. That is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this, you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. So he says, your faith is more important than gold, because what happens with gold when it's thrown into the fire? Well, from the get-go, gold doesn't really have life. And then when it's thrown into fire, it perishes according to him. It's made new. Our faith is so much better than that because our faith is living. Jesus was born. He, <laughs> when he died, he rose again on that third day. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. When Jesus was born, I find it really interesting that angels are present in speaking to Mary and comforting her and saying that she's going to be with child and it's going to be by the Holy Spirit. Being with Joseph and comforting him and saying, uh, your fiance, who you're about to get married, didn't sin against you. Your relationship is still good because the exciting thing to come that God has always planned from the beginning is that his son is going to come and you get to be a part of this, Joseph. The shepherds get to see the angels. The wise men, they get to see angels. And the angels long to look onto this truth that he is living, that he is real, and that the war against him is nothing really. Nietzsche can say God is dead all he wants. He's flat out wrong because Jesus is living and he is here. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Which means use a napkin when you eat later. And also, 
Do good works and love other people mightily. Live into God's grace, which is God's kind love. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things. Oh, there's that word perishable again. Not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with life, the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Now, I know Peter is writing to Jewish Christians, or to Christians, a long time ago, almost 2,000 years ago. But, brothers and sisters, this is still true today because Jesus is still living. We have hope. We are born into new hope because Jesus is alive. He's flesh. He went to the, sit at the right hand of the Father until the Father makes his enemies a footstool under his feet. <laughs> By the way, I kind of like that idea. I've been thinking about that a little bit because I've always wondered, you know, thrones are made to be uncomfortable so that the king, when he's doing his work, he's reminded that it's for the people. He's reminded that it's for everybody. And I just wonder why a king would have a footstool if it's supposed to be uncomfortable. And those of you that work at Lazy Boy and that uh, have Lazy Boys in your home, I wonder if this isn't the kind of footstool we should be thinking about as Jesus is living. Jesus' work is finished. He's kicking back with his feet up, loving us, until his enemies are made a footstool underneath him, because he's living. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest, or alive, in the last times for the sake of you, who through him... In are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience for the truth, for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly with a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of the imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Brothers and sisters, there's a couple more verses, but I've got to stop there. And we have to recognize this truth. If we recognize the truth that Jesus is living and that Jesus is our Savior and he, he's God in the flesh and he really was born and we get to celebrate that truth, we also recognize the truth of what he said. His word is living. And we get to be a part of it. And I love that we've got to be a part of this together. I want to read this with you. Um, this year, for those of you that are visiting, this year we've had a challenge to read daily together with our families using this day-by-day -day Bible. And if you're visiting with us this morning, come visit me later on, and I'm going to get you one of these Bibles because we want every single family to have one of these. But this is written at a second grade level so that way our whole families can come together and read in chronological order the living word of God and to share this. And so the author is Karen Henley, and as she translated and put these things together, um, there's times where I learn, because sometimes I need things at a second grade level, where I learn immense and deep truths because of the simplicity of what it is. Let me read what I just read from the ESV version from, from this. Let me read 1 Peter to you. And notice the living terms that are here as she translates, as she, as she shares this. To the people God chose, cheer for God. He has been very kind to us. He gave us a new hope. It's all because Jesus came back to life. For us, it's like being born all over again. Now we get what God planned to give his children. It will never fade away. It will never rot. It will never die. God keeps it in heaven for you. You believe, so God's power is like a shield to you. Everyone will see that he saves you in the end. You show your great joy about this, even though you're having hard times. These hard times will last for just a while. Your faith is richer than gold. Gold won't last, but your faith will last even through the hard times. That will show how important Jesus is to you. His greatness will shine. He will come back again. Then people will see him for who he is is. You haven't seen Jesus, but you love him anyway. You believe in him, and you are full of joy. It's better than words can tell. It shines in you. That's because your souls are being saved. You are getting what you wanted from your faith. 
So get your minds ready. Control yourselves. Put all your hope in Jesus' kind love. He will be kind to you when he comes. Be children of God who obey. Don't keep doing things that are sinful that you wanted to do. You wanted to do these things because or when they didn't when you didn't understand. But God is clean from sin. So you be clean from sin too. Don't sin in anything you do. God says in his word, be sinless and holy because I'm holy. God is Father who judges each person. He is fair. He doesn't treat any person better than another. So live like you belong in heaven, not to earth. I love that. Live now. Live where Jesus is, like you belong in heaven, not on earth. Treat God like the important father that he is. The way your fathers lived did no good, but you were saved from the way of life. You were saved because someone paid with silver or gold. You were saved because Jesus paid with his blood. Jesus was clean, sinless, and holy. God chose Jesus before he made the world. Years later, God sent him to earth. God sent him for you. You believe in God because of Jesus. God made Jesus come back to life and showed how great Jesus is. So you believe and hope in God. Now you're clean from sin. You've obeyed the truth. So you truly love God's people. Have a deep love for each other. Love with your whole heart. It's like you've been born again. You haven't been born again into a family that dies. You've been born again into a family that never dies. God's word lives and lasts forever. Isaiah said it this way, God's word stays fresh forever. So at the end of 1 Peter, I'm not, I don't remember if I have a slide. Yeah, I do. There it is. I'm going to read verses 22 through 25 in the ESV, and I think this is a really interesting way of uh, um, sharing, of, of commenting on what God's word says. So here we go. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for sincere brotherly love, love one another from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and the glory of the flower of the, the glory, and all of its glory, like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the Lord, word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. The most important news, the most important truth that we have in this world is that Jesus was born. He became flesh. He came on this earth. Angels longed to see what was going on. And it is incredibly good news. And God's been talking about it ever since man's been in a relationship with him. Adam and Eve sin. God reveals that curses are a part of that sin. And he says to Eve, your seed will crush the head of the serpent, but the serpent will bruise his heel. There's promises always after that, and it's always about Jesus, that he lives, and that he came to give us life and to give it abundantly. So brothers and sisters, it's exactly who we are as we follow Jesus. We're a family that never dies. Now, some people may go on ahead of us, but are they really dead? Are they really that we're never going to see them again? No, we walk in a new hope. We've been born into a new hope, into this new truth that Jesus is living eternally, and therefore we have the ability to because of him. In Luke chapter 2, verse 11, the angels come. We talked about this last Sunday, but the angels come to the um, shepherds that are in the field, and they say this to them. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. There's a reason why we're having a holiday meal today. And by the way, for those of you that are upset that we called it a holiday meal instead of a Christmas meal, get over it. Holiday literally means holy day. <laughs> it's a holy day. We're celebrating the holy, every day is holy in the eyes of God. We're celebrating the literal truth that Jesus is born, that he is living, and that he is risen as well, and that he is here. And so let's celebrate. Let's eat together and have joy together. Jude Jesus' own brother writes one of the weirdest letters in the New Testament. But at the end of that letter as he's writing, and by the way, I love how she translated it because Jude's letter is a whole truth that God is living, that Jesus is living. And so because of that, the angels don't even say things against Satan. They let God deal with it because he's living. Stuff like that shows up in Jude. And at the end of Jude, we get this really good message, this good news that's true for us today. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, 
Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. And then he ends with this blessing, and I pray that this blessing be for all of us as we follow Jesus and serve a living Savior who became like us and was born and who rose again after they tried to kill him. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, which means he's always living, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. If you need to follow Jesus because he is alive and he is a risen Savior, the way is easy. Follow him in faith. That's what we've been reading in 1 Peter. Follow him believing, be, believing that you can be born into newness of life. And the great thing about that newness of life is Jesus teaches us we gain that when we follow him in baptism. We die to our sins, and we're born again. Jesus talks to Nicodemus. He says, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And that's what we do when we follow him in baptism. We are born again. God raises us up in newness of life and gives us life that we might be able to live into the joy that there doesn't need to be a war against Christmas because Jesus was born. Anybody that tries to even begin to claim that God is dead misses the fact that there are multiple witnesses that are willing to write multiple letters that they were with him. John even starts 1 John by saying, that which we have seen with our own eyes, who we have touched with our own hands, who we have heard. He talks about the fact, the truth, that he was with Jesus. He has seen the light, and the light is living. If you need to follow Jesus, it's a very wise choice because you join a family that never dies. As Jesus is eternal and always living, we are made like him. We are too. And we get to celebrate with joy. We get to come together and eat. Eating is a good thing, especially when we do it right and we don't eat too much because otherwise it hurts too much afterwards. So that's my caution for you. And so uh, we worship, we celebrate, we have joy. Even in the midst of our struggles, we know Jesus is living and right there with us. And when it's hard, we remember that oil is refined and it's perishable, but we are imperishable. We have life because Jesus has given it to us. If you need prayer for anything, and another challenge is celebrate the birth of Jesus. We ask you to come forward now as we stand and sing.